R is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our, our Healthy You webinar series. Today's topic is Undiet Your Life. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to answer any questions you may have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We will answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted once the presentation concludes. Your questions will always remain anonymous. Today's presenter is Barbara Brogleworth. She's a registered dietitian nutritionist for Mather Hospital's Bariatric Center of Excellence. Barbara earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Queens College, completed a dietetic internship at Stony Brook University, and received her master's degree in health science from Stony Brook University, and is an ACE certified behavior change specialist. In addition to supporting our bariatric surgery patients, Barbara also educates community members through Mather's Medical Weight Management Program, helping others find wellness through balanced nutrition, physical fitness, and a healthy lifestyle is central to Barbara's work. All right, Barbara, um, I'll hand it off to you and you can start the presentation. Awesome, thank you, Jonathan. And thank you everybody for coming today. Hold on one sec, let me pull up my preso here. There we go. And you can see that, right, Jonathan? Yep, you're all good. So, thank you. So, uh, hi, my name is Barbara. I'm one of the dietitians here at our medical weight management program, as Jonathan introduced. I'm going to be presenting on how to achieve your best personal body weight and foster optimum health without dieting. And I know that kind of sounds like we're talking out of both sides of our mouth here, and hopefully I'll clarify in the next couple of slides. We're also going to be talking about our comprehensive medical weight management program that's offered here at Mather. We've been doing that since 2013. I don't have anything to disclose. Today we're going to be discussing weight management. I'm going to be using the terms obese and obesity. If you are sensitive to these terms or you have a history of an eating disorder, this content may not be appropriate for you. You took the time to attend today. So I want to honor that by presenting what sometimes may sound like daunting information in a very respectable way. So in terms of our learning objectives, we're going to examine how heredity, activity level, and body composition influence a person's weight, identify health problems that are associated with being overweight, and summarize some strategies for losing weight. I found this quote and it really stuck with me. Your healthiest weight is the weight that you reach when you're living the healthiest life that you can also enjoy. Keeping weight off long-term means liking the lifestyle that helped you to lose weight in the first place. In other words, instead of starving yourself or eating nothing but protein shakes and supplement snacks, making changes that you actually enjoy and want to stick to over the long haul is going to help you to sustain a healthy weight. So what, what is a healthy weight? First, I want to talk about what a healthy weight is not. A healthy weight is not what we weighed when we were 20 nothing. A healthy weight is not what the billion dollar diet industry tells us it is. The diet industry relies on us to feel badly about ourselves. They sell diet solutions that are either unattainable or sustainable. And when they don't work, their marketing strategy is to make the individual believe they failed. Diet companies want their customers to constantly feel the need to go on another diet so they can keep making money off of them. The fact is, 95% of all diets fail. One statistic that was published in the Boston Medical Center stated that the average um, of 45 million Americans go on a diet each year. And according to results from a British survey of 2,000 adults, they concluded that the average person is going to try 126 fad diets in their lifetime. So that begs the question, if diets worked, wouldn't they have worked the first time? So diet culture equates thinness with health. It shames us into believing that we're somehow broken if we're in a bigger body. 
Diet culture leads to disordered eating. It can begin as early as 10 years old. It promotes harmful substances like over-the-counter weight loss pills, laxatives, colonics, and it promotes these fad diets that are often too restrictive to follow for the long term, and they don't provide sustainable results. So a healthy weight is, first of all, accepting the body that we were born with. None of us as babies hated our bodies, right? It wasn't until culture had an influence on how we view ourselves. Um, it's taking steps to achieve a healthy weight that's within our own body's limits. One that's going to help us stay healthy throughout our life and minimize our risk of lifestyle diseases. So how do health professionals or clinicians um, assess a person's weight? So they use three key measures. They can use BMI although that's a little bit flawed because all it does is take into account a, a person's height and their weight. So if you take somebody like Arnold Schwarzenegger or a bodybuilder, they're gonna have a really high BMI, but they're very healthy. It's just that it's all muscle and muscle weighs a lot, right? Some clinicians will use a waist circumference or we can use risk factors for diseases and conditions that are associated with obesity. Um, so things like high blood pressure, having a high LDL cholesterol, that's that, that little sticky cholesterol that gets stuck to the inside of our arteries, having a low HDL cholesterol, that's that big globular cholesterol that picks up the LDL so we can excrete it out, having high triglycerides, having high blood glucose, um, a family history of premature heart disease, physical activity, and cigarette smoking are all risk factors. So, why does our society struggle with our weight status? Um, you know, as we look back on our ancestors, we go back two or 300 years, we were really more worried about famine than we were about our thyroid, our gut, our heart disease, our cancer, or these issues that are top of our mind today. So what's changed? Well, first of all, you know, we're working more hours, right? So we've got, you know, if you are a two-parent family, most times you've got both parents that are working outside the home. And, you know, if you have kids and they have activities and you're running them around, we live in a very competitive society. So who's got to, you know, take all of these extracurricular activities to make themselves, you know, uh, better candidates for college, you know. So we've got all of those things. And then we're being told by dietitians like me, oh, you should meal prep. You should take the time to go food shopping on your own. Well, we have to take into account that, people have busy lives, so we have to help them navigate that, right? What are the tools that could be available? Um, we're more isolated as a society, even before COVID. You know, we've got our personal computers and our smartphones and televisions and all of these things that take us, you know, more and more introverted to ourselves and we, we have less community. Um, we get very conflicting advice on nutrition. Now, granted, nutrition is a very, um, it's a very young science, right? So we're, and, and because it is a science, you know, things are constantly evolving and changing, but we're getting all this conflicting advice and nutrition, uh, advice on nutrition, I should say. And then, of course, we are heavily marketed to, to overconsume these highly processed foods. So marketing and nutritional information powerfully influence our food choices. And food marketing is a powerful driver of these ultra-processed food consumption campaigns with social media and new media resulting in a closer interaction between consumers and their brands. So um, one of the things I like to do when I come in on an early day is I'll run by McDonald's. I love to get an Egg McMuffin sandwich and they invariably ask me if I want to, you know, am I going to use my mobile app today? No, I don't want your mobile app on my phone because then you're going to be making me think about some of the other products that you have that I wouldn't be thinking about already, right? So it's that very close interaction between those uh, food companies and us more so than ever in the past. And then we have to take into account that weight gain is multifactorial, right? We just discussed environmental and lifestyle factors, but there are genetic factors. So to date, we know that there are more than 400 different genes that have been implicated in the causes of overweight or obesity, although only a handful appear to be major players. Genes contribute to the causes of obesity in many ways. They can affect our appetite. They can affect our satiety. That's our sense of fullness. 
It can affect our metabolism. That's how many calories we're burning at rest. It can affect our food cravings. It can affect how fat is distributed on our body. Um, the tendency to use eating as a way to cope with stress has also been shown to be genetic. Um, so in some cases, this predisposition to being overweight can be as high as 70 to 80 percent. So having a rough idea how large a role genes play in our weight can be helpful in terms of addressing that from a realistic perspective, right? Then we've got physiological factors. So things um, like changes in our basal metabolic rate. Um, that can happen if we start to lose muscle mass, which happens naturally as we age if we don't stay ahead of that, right? Our muscles are our calorie burning engines. Um, hormones, you know, in particular, um, women who are perimenopausal or menopausal um, start to gain weight in different areas and they gain weight a lot faster because as our body loses estrogen, our body really wants to hold on to it and estrogen likes to sequester itself in fat cells. So a lot of postmenopausal women find it harder to lose weight um, in addition to the fact that they're losing all that lean muscle mass if they're not staying on top of it. Um, sleep quality and stress management also play a role from a physiological perspective. And then behavioral, you know, some people find comfort in these hyper palatable foods and they may eat them to relieve stress or loneliness or that kind of thing. Our gut health plays a role, so also known as our microbiome can impact the production of hunger hormones. There's one in particular called ghrelin that's produced in the lining of our stomach, which can help us control how hungry we feel. So an unhealthy gut microbiome can increase some inflammatory markers, which can lead to weight gain and metabolic disease. Um, and the science is still very young on that, but it's moving very, very quickly. So it's an exciting field if you're interested in that. Um, medications, I can't tell you how many people come through here who, you know, are on either medications for chronic pain or maybe they're on medications due to anxiety or stress. And sometimes those medications can either increase a person's appetite or it can make weight loss harder, right? And then injuries that limit physical activity. Somebody could be in a car accident, no fault of their own. They were really physically active before. Now they're not, but they haven't adjusted their eating habits to compensate for the fact that they have less physical activity. So all of these things, just to say that we understand that weight gain is a confluence of all of these factors. And when we work with our patients, we work with them where they are. So we can set realistic goals. So we have this overconsumption of these hypercaloric foods. And I, I hope you took notice to the fact that I'm using very objective terms when I describe food. I'm not saying one is good or bad, healthy or unhealthy. It's hypercaloric. What does hypercaloric mean? It means that it has a lot of calories, but it's not giving us a lot of nutrients, right? And it's in these ultra processed foods, and that can lead to overeating and weight gain. So these hyper palatable foods literally hijack our taste buds because they've got the perfect amount of sugar, salt, and saturated fat that light up these reward centers of our brain and promote overconsumption. So you can see with this picture on the right, this is a functional MRI. That means that they put somebody into a machine, into an MRI, and they either showed them pictures of these hyperpalatable foods or they actually have them, you know, taste it while they're in the MRI, and then they can see the areas of their brain that light up. And it's the reward center that's similar to some of these illicit drugs. Um, they're available anytime, anywhere. You can't go to tar um, TJ Maxx, rather, you know, because you want to get an outfit, and then you're standing on that invariably long line, and you've got tons of goodies that you weren't even thinking about before you walked in. Or you're running errands and you want to go into 7-Eleven for an innocent cup of coffee, but now you've got to walk past the donuts and all the other goodies and the cheese cookies and the creamers. Again, all things that you weren't thinking about before, but they may, you know, spark you to want to try it, right? We call those things food triggers. So, you know, it's important to understand that those things exist. There was a, a quote that I heard recently from um, another dietitian, her name is Marion Nessel, and she's out of, um, she's a professor over at Columbia University, and she said, she's a big advocate for public health, and she said, you know, this 
this obesity that we're dealing with in our society is, is really a public health issue that we're holding individuals accountable for. It's not fair. The stacks are, are set against us, right? But if we can build strategies over time, we can help to navigate that. Now, why are these hyperpalatable foods add so much weight so quickly is that Research shows that people tend to eat this processed food faster and then we over consume an additional 500 calories. So let's just do a compare and contrast for a second. Let's say on the one hand, you have the equivalent of 500 calories in a piece of chocolate cake, right? Now, on the other hand, let's take the equivalent of that and let's say apples. We'll do three Honeycrisp apples, right? Because they're pretty large. Who could eat three Honeycrisp apples at one time? Probably not, right? Because it's filled with fiber, you know, a lot of volume, high water content. We get a bellyache if we ate that much. But if you're like me, you could probably have a second piece of that chocolate cake and not think anything of it. So you can see how easy it is because those foods don't have the nutrients that are going to keep us fuller longer. That's not to say that we shouldn't ever have chocolate cake, but it's just being mindful. We don't have a birthday every day. We probably shouldn't be eating chocolate cake as often as we do as a society. So there are medical complications of being overweight or obese that we know about. We know it's linked to certain cancers, and particularly these hormone cancers like breast, uterine, cervical, or colon. Um, we know that um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is on the rise. Um, osteoarthritis, you know, obvious reasons, gout, things like that. So we know that there are medical complications. But the good news is that we don't have to lose as much as we think to get into a healthier zone. So let's say we want to control our blood sugar, right? If we want to prevent diabetes. If we lose 5 to 10% of our weight, we'll lower the risk of developing diabetes by 58%. If we want to manage our diabetes, then losing 5 to 10% of our body weight can help improve our blood sugar numbers. In terms of heart health, losing just 10 pounds to help manage our high blood pressure, you know, weight loss reduces the strain on our heart. So being overweight puts this extra strain on our heart, which increases the risk for developing things like high blood pressure and damage to our blood vessels that can over time lead to serious health threats. And then in terms of our bone and joint health research shows that losing 10 pounds can relieve 40 pounds of pressure from our knees. So where do we start? So as we just learned, there are many, many factors that contribute to our weight status. Some are within our control while others are not. The key to long-term weight loss is making small changes over time. So this consistency is really key. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of James Clear, but he wrote a book called Atomic Habits. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list forever. And he basically did a compilation of, um, you know, a lot of research. So he's not, a, he's not an academic himself. He's an author. But he compiled all this research. And a lot of behavioral change specialists, you know, really rely on these small changes over time. And, you know, if we think about it, one of the things that he says in his book is we're all making choices that are going to make us better or worse on a daily basis, right? So that's that 1% change over time. If we nudge ourselves in that direction where we're just making one little better choice at a time, first of all, the smaller the change, the easier it is or the more lasting it is. And then it gives us that confidence, that self-efficacy so we could do it again. And then we tend to build on that. Um, but... Most of us want radical change. So, you know, part of what we try to teach here and what I hope to impart to you guys is that these small changes over time really can make a big difference. So there are three key aspects we can focus on. So, you know, according to the National Institute of Health, changing up these areas of our life can lead us to a healthy weight, um, adopting a healthy eating plan, being physically active and reducing our screen time. So if we follow a healthy diet and if we are overweight, we reduce our daily caloric intake by about 500 calories a day for weight loss. So there's about 3,500 calories on one pound of fat, right? We've all heard of that losing one to two pounds a week is a healthy way to do it. Why? Because if we look at it from a realistic perspective, we shave that 500 calories off on a daily basis or we can 
burn 250 by exercise and shave 250 off of our caloric intake. And the combination of these two um, helps for weight loss, but it also may result in a decrease in abdominal fat and an increase in our cardiorespiratory fitness. So what habits should we look at for a healthy weight? We've got our personal accountability, portion control, consuming nutrient-dense foods, and I'm going to unpack these on the next couple of slides. Um, getting regular physical activity, adequate sleep, being mindful of the choices that we make when we're eating, and staying hydrated. So personal accountability. I used to not like using this word accountability because I feel like somebody's pointing a finger. But my patients will say it to me often. And so I thought, all right, let's look at what this really is. Personal accountability is just an obligation or a willingness to accept responsibility or to account for one's own actions. Um, it's about deciding on a course of an action or a goal and creating a framework that holds you to account, ensuring that you're staying consistent and carrying out that action and working towards your ultimate goal. So some people find that weighing or measuring themselves on a regular basis, maybe once a week on a set day, helps them to stay accountable to themselves. Some people have, they have a buddy, recruit a friend or a family member, arrange to check in with them regularly so they can share how they're progressing. Um, keeping a food diary that promotes mindfulness because it helps us in that moment to decide, mm, if I'm going to write it down, do I really want to do that? Um, or you can share some of these apps with a friend for added accountability um, or find or set up or join a support group. So in terms of nutrition, um, it's important to have balanced meals. Right? We're not talking super low carb. We're not talking all of those fad diets. We're just talking about having a balanced plate. So to make nutrient dense food choices each day and limit the consumption of the foods that are high in calories and lower in these nutrients. Um, what do I mean by a balanced plate? So we see here we've got a lean protein. We've got whole grains, right? Now notice the whole grains are about 25% of the plate here. That's because grains are very nutrient dense, but they can also be very calorie dense for a small amount. So giving people the proper portion sizes for them can help them to make, you know, to just kind of adjust for that, right? And then vegetables are literally like 30 calories per half cup. So they don't cost us anything, but they do give us a lot of nutrients, a lot of vitamins and minerals, but also um, a lot of volume and fiber and stuff to feed our gut microbiome. So the more we can aim to get those vegetables in, it's going to help us overall, not just for our weight status. Um, hydration. So staying hydrated can, you know, modestly increase our calorie burn. It can reduce our overall caloric intake because sometimes our body uh, misreads thirst for hunger. So we may actually be thirsty, but our body is telling us that we're hungry. So if we're properly hydrated, we won't necessarily get those mismatched cues. Um, and it can promote fat loss. So um, a good analogy that I can think of with fat loss is there's a process, a metabolic process in the body called lipolysis, and that's the breakdown of lipids, which is fat. Um, and olysis is, is that breakdown of that using water. So if you think of like a water mill and how that creates energy, it's kind of the same thing and how water helps to promote fat loss. And mindfulness, um, being aware of the foods that we're choosing to eat, how much we're eating and why we're eating. If it's out of hunger, enjoy the food. But if it's an environmental influence, your mood or just because, maybe take a moment to make a conscious decision about that. You know, we live in a world where we're very distracted when we're eating. We're either eating at our computers or, you know, looking at our smartphones, eating on the run. So mindfulness says slow down, chew your food well, maybe use smaller plates, unplug from your devices, make very conscious choices, and try to really love what you eat without judging yourself. So mindfulness doesn't say don't ever have the chocolate cake. But it says, if you're going to have it, maybe put it on a nice plate, sit down, and enjoy every single bite so you're not distracted. 
And I mentioned sleep earlier. So there has been research that, you know, found a link between sleep deprivation and weight gain. And studies have shown that when sleep decreases, our weight can increase. I see this a lot with our shift workers, people that are working overnights really struggle with this. Um, and part of that is because of the hormones that affect our eating behavior are affected by our sleep, right? So we've got ghrelin. I mentioned ghrelin earlier. It's produced in the lining of our stomach. It's the hormone that's responsible for us feeling hungry. When we don't get enough sleep, the ghrelin level can go up. So just think, grr, ghrelin, like my stomach is growling, right? Studies have shown that sleeping less than eight hours a day can potentially increase that ghrelin level. Now, leptin, that's the hormone that tells our brain to stop eating, and sleep deprivation can decrease our leptin level. And then we've got cortisol. So we've all, I think, heard of cortisol. It's known as the stress hormone, and it can fuel our hunger. So lack of sleep can add to, lead to an increase in the body's level of cortisol. So we've got our increase in ghrelin, our increase in cortisol, our decrease in leptin, that can lead to an increase in our weight. So this is based off of the uh, USDA's MyPlate recommendations, um, and they use a 2,000 calorie diet. So if somebody would come in to me to meet one-on-one, -on -one, we would adjust these quantities. Some people are doing a 1,200, 1,300 calorie diet. Some people are 15. Some people should be at 18. So we can make those adjustments. But general rule of thumb, aiming for let's say one and a half cups of fruit per day. What are the equivalents? Well, it's either a cup raw, frozen or cooked or canned, which would be the equivalent of a half a cup of dried or one cup of fruit juice, although we don't really recommend fruit juice because it lacks the fiber and it can have too much sugar in it. Um, aiming for about two cups of vegetables. Um, so one cup of raw cooked or canned vegetables would be the equivalent of two cups of leafy or one cup of 100% um, vegetable juice. And then our grains, yes, we do tell people to have grains, like I mentioned earlier. They're very healthy, very nutrient dense. Um, but one ounce would count as either one slice of bread, one ounce of ready to eat uh, cereal, or half a cup of cooked rice pasta or cereal. And then in terms of protein, protein, of course, is very important for our immune system. It's important for our overall health. We're made of protein, so we have to get adequate protein. Our muscles need adequate protein. There is some very recent research showing that as we get older, so those of us who are north of, um, let's say, 40 or 50, our body doesn't use protein as efficiently as it did when we were in our 20s. So, um, so recommendations for older adults who want to maintain that lean muscle mass to stay independent and strong as they get older may require a little bit more protein. But this is just giving you what the equivalents are. So one ounce of seafood, lean meat, or poultry would be the equivalent of one egg, would be the equivalent of about a tablespoon of peanut butter, a quarter cup of cooked beans, peas or lentils or about a half ounce of unsalted nuts or seeds. And generally speaking, if we aim for about three ounces per meal, that would give us about 21 grams at each meal. And then dairy. So, you know, dairy kind of gets villainized nowadays, but it's a really efficient way for us to get our calcium. And so for those of you who may not know this, you know, when we're little up until we're about 26 years old, Whatever calcium we consume, our body deposits it in our bones. So we call that banking our calcium. But once we're past 26 or 30, if we don't get enough calcium in our body, because calcium is so critical for our nerve function and our muscle contraction, like our heart, right, our body's going to maintain a certain level of all times. And if we're not taking it in orally, then our body is going to take it from our bones. So getting you know, aiming for three cups of dairy it could be either one cup of dairy milk or yogurt. It could be one cup of lactose-free dairy milk or yogurt. It could be a cup of fortified soy milk or yogurt or the equivalent of about one and a half ounces of cheese. But it is important to make sure that we're getting adequate dairy in our diet. What else can we do for our weight? Maybe change our shopping habits. We've all heard this, eat before you go grocery shopping. Don't shop hungry. 
make a list before you shop so you're not just willy-nilly picking things that, you know, take your fancy off the shelves, knowing that food manufacturers hire psychologists to research where our eyes are looking in the supermarket so they know exactly where to put things. Um, choose a checkout line without a candy display. Now we have all of these great um, self-checkouts that we can do that don't necessarily have the displays there. Um, buy and try serving a new fruit or vegetable like jicama or fava beans, bok choy, star fruit, and keeping our portions under control. So the plate industry has increased their plate size gradually over the past 50 years. So if you look at this, in the 1960s, we were consuming about 800 calories on about eight and a half to nine inches of a plate, right? 1980s, we go up to 10 inches and now it's 1,000 calories. By the 2000s, we're 11 inches and 1,600. And by 2009, we're consuming almost 1,900 calories on the size of our plate. I was teaching a class on this recently, and the patient said to me, you know, it's funny you should say that because when I was shopping for my dishwasher, because my plates are so big, I had to bring my plates with me. Think about that. And that's a visual cue. So if we tell somebody, just eat off of a smaller plate, just see how you're satisfied with that. Measure out your portions. We do eat with our eyes first. So if you try to put a smaller portion on a bigger plate, you might feel like you're over restricting. But if you put it on a smaller plate, like a salad plate, it may feel adequate for you. So some other ways that we can control our portion sizes, maybe sharing an entree with someone if we go out. Um, if the entrees are large, maybe choose an appetizer or a side dish instead. Don't serve seconds unless you're truly hungry. Share a dessert or choose fruit. Eat sweet fruits, uh, eat sweet foods, that was hard to say, in small amounts. Um, and to reduce temptation, maybe we don't keep those sweets in the house. Maybe we have to go out to get them for a special treat. Um, cut or share high calorie foods like cheese and chocolate into small pieces so that we only eat a few pieces at a time. Pair it with something so we're always looking at having a balance. We tell our patients here, protein and produce, right? So if you're having some watermelon and you want to have a couple of pieces of cheese with that, that's pairing those two things together. Um, apple and peanut butter, same thing. Uh, we talked about the smaller plates and then, of course, skipping the buffet. Changing the way we prepare our foods. Cutting back on added fats or oils and cooking or spreads. You know, don't do that Rachel Ray EVOO where she's just dousing the pan. It's good to have olive oil in our diet. It's a good monounsaturated fat, but we want to make sure that we, you know, it's 120 calories per tablespoon. So that can add up quickly. And for what? We're wasting it, right? Maybe try grilling or steaming or baking or air frying instead of frying our foods using herbs and spices and low fat seasonings to flavor our food so we're not so reliant on the fat. Again, it's not to say that we shouldn't have fat because it does help to transfer that flavor, but just again, being mindful. Um, using low fat sour cream mayo or sauces or using them in smaller amounts. Serving whole grains every day and topping off our yogurt with berries or our favorite fruit. So activity, right? We, we do a whole class in our program on physical activity. And these are examples of um, what we call non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So these are all the calories that we're burning if we walk instead of drive or park farther away or we take the stairs instead of the escalator or the elevator. Maybe we go for a half hour walk instead of watching TV. Um, Maybe just doing our activities of daily living. I mean, who is mowing their lawn anymore? Gardening by ourselves. Again, because we have these busy lives, we've taken a lot of those things that, you know, we used to be a lot more active. Maybe doing our own housework if we can, or doing calf raises when we're brushing our teeth. Or, you know, live actively, join an exercise group, use exercise videos that are available on YouTube from certified trainers, or take up a dance class if you like. Um, I tell my patients here when I teach, my husband is a uh, professional competitive dancer. He does that as a hobby. And that was his physical activity. And over the pandemic, when everything shut down, I could not get him to move. We bought a very fancy treadmill. 
you know what? It was one of those ones that would take you to like all the iFit programs that take you to Portugal and, you know, you have the trainers taking you everywhere. He would do it on occasion, but it wasn't until he was able to resume dance that he started being physically active on a regular basis. So I always tell my patients, find an activity that you like to do. I have two left feet. I'm not a dancer. Throw me on a, you know, strap me into a cycle and put me in a spin class. That's my favorite. But everybody has to come to it on their own, trying on different things. The idea is just to move our bodies. We were designed to move. Um, so what are some practical tips? Eating a balanced meal before going to work, including a lean protein, a high fiber starch, making half your plate vegetables, choosing light snacks like fruits, vegetables, and protein um, will help to promote satiety, right? Remember, we're going to get the fiber from the fruits and vegetables, and the protein is going to help to promote satiety as well. Um, when possible, take breaks to eat snacks mindfully. Ensure that you have water or low sugar drinks available. Grab frequent sips throughout your shift if you're at work. Avoid high fat, high sugar foods because they can ultimately worsen fatigue, sluggishness, and motivation. And try to avoid going long periods without eating. A lot of people ask me what my thoughts are on intermittent fasting. And I say, you know, the jury's kind of still out on that. You know, there are some studies that show that it does help people to um you know like decrease their their um their glucose levels so there there is some preliminary evidence but what i say to my patients is if i have somebody that struggles with night eating out of boredom and they say you know what what works for me is if i create a rule where i stop eating at seven o'clock then i don't go into the kitchen and i'm not looking for food if that works for that person i'm not going to fix what's not broken but I do like to emphasize that it's really important to get some specific nutrients. I talked about calcium. I talked a little bit about protein, but I didn't talk about all the antioxidants and vitamins and minerals that we get from our fruits and vegetables. And again, you know, when we're 20 nothing, our body is very resilient, but the older we get, the more our body relies on those nutrients from those foods. So if I have somebody that I feel may be over restricting and not getting those nutrients, then I'm likely to tell them not to do that because they may need a bigger window of time to get those nutrients in there. Um, and some people go long periods without eating, and then they're starving, and they eat this giant meal at the end of the day, um, and they're also so hungry that, you know, their prefrontal cortex has gone completely offline. They're not able to make a, 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 I guess, a conscious or mindful decision, and they may be more prone to eat these hyperpalatable, hypercaloric foods. So what are some grab-and-go snacks? Um, overnight oats, vegetable sticks or whole wheat pita with hummus, rye crisp breads with apple slices topped with nut butter, protein bar is a good go-to, aiming for about 16 to 20 grams of protein, unsalted nuts with a piece of fruit, maybe having a soup containing vegetables, lentils or beans, lentils and beans, great source of protein and fiber, um, and incorporating healthy fats, right? So you know, again, going back to that balanced meal. So lean meats, fish, things like cottage cheese, eggs, nuts and seeds, avocado. Avocado is a condiment, though. Don't eat a half of a avocado. You know, having it, you know, use avocado like you would butter, right? So if you want avocado toast, I would say using maybe like an eighth or a quarter. Um, baked beans, chickpeas, lentils, whole wheat bread, etc. all good go-tos for grab-and-go snacks. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our program here at Mather. So we really try to emphasize that weight management is so much more complex than just what we eat. So our classes are designed to build awareness around how our choices in our environment impact our behaviors and how we can build strategies to help take back control. So what we are, we're a medically supervised weight loss program. It's a joint effort between the patient and the healthcare professionals. I always say it's collaboration. We emphasize the lifestyle changes that are based upon the principles of the Mediterranean diet. What we're not about is rapid weight loss, eating the same thing every day, avoiding carbohydrates, um, filling up on too much fiber, 
or rigid menus or supplements. So our vision and our mission, um, serving the needs of the community by offering a multidisciplinary approach to medical weight management. So we've been serving the community from about 2014 to 2023. We've helped over 750 community members lose weight and achieve long-term behavior change. It's evidence-based. What do we mean by that? Well, it's, it focuses on the principles of the Mediterranean diet, which incorporates good dietary protein, healthy fats, and a moderate exercise program. Um, the Mediterranean diet has been has over 50 years of research behind it, and it, it consistently gets rated as one of the top dietary patterns, I'll say, to follow. Uh, we also follow the National Weight Registry, the National Institute of Health, and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetic Guidelines for weight loss. Our target population includes people that have a BMI over 30 with or without a comorbidity, or BMI between 27 to 30 with a comorbidity, so something like hypertension or diabetes, hyperlipidemia. Personalized weight loss, so the centerpiece of our weight loss program revolves around personalized medical nutrition therapy. So yes, we do have meal plans that we give to people just as like training wheels, but we try to encourage them to make, to, to give them the education so they have the autonomy to make the decisions on their own. On average, our patients lose between seven to 10% of their body weight. At the initial visit, um, all patients undergo a comprehensive assessment with the physician and the registered dietitian. We collect the following information to develop a personalized program. So we do initial measurements like height and weight. Uh, we look at recent blood tests and um, we try to get a weight history, eating habits, medication review, past medical history, so we can come up with an individualized plan. And the program components, um, weekly nutrition education for about 10 weeks, focused on behavior modification, exercise, physician supervision. Weight loss medications um, over the last couple of years have been added to help augment weight loss and may be available based on the official, I'm sorry, the physician assessment. So we use um, our group classes to promote behavioral change that are based on cognitive modality for behavioral change. So um, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy focuses on changing how you think about yourself, how you act, and the circumstances that influence how you act. So it's an effective treatment for a wide range of um, issues that people deal with. And it's helpful for behavioral change because it uses techniques like goal setting, self-monitoring, feedback, and reinforcement, which are all key components of our program. So we have a structured 10-week instructor-led education program that's delivered by our dietitians. Um, we do weekly weigh-ins. So, you know, um, we're now doing hybrid classes. So we do the classes either, we have some people come in and some people join us online. Um, nutrition, cognitive behavioral classes to promote sustainable weight management, weekly emails and education material uh, to complement our sessions, and then a transition to an optional maintenance program. And our classes focus on nutrition education, self-monitoring, stimulus control, cognitive restructuring, stress management, and social support. So this is just a list of our classes, sustainable habits, habit formation and goal setting, physical activity, lifestyle behavior, triggers and reinforcers, mindful eating. We do a class on navigating the supermarket, food labels, portion distortion. I do a class on the science behind the Mediterranean diet where we go deep into what antioxidants are, why they're important for our health. We also go very deep into fiber and probiotics and how um, you know, the research on that is changing and how that affects our weight management, our weight status. We do a class on strategies for dining out, and then our last class is, we call it Bite by Bite. So we do a comprehensive end of program follow-up. It includes a visit with the physician and the dietitian. We do something called a metabolic analysis. Metabolic analysis, so this machine is called an indirect calorimeter. And what it does is it measures an individual's metabolic rate 
by determining the actual resting energy expenditure, namely the amount of calories we're burning in a resting state. And it does this by measuring oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange, and this process is called indirect calorimetry. Uh, easy for me to say. Um, anyway, it, it'll provide additional information regarding estimated calories burned with exercise as well as at rest. So we do it at the end of the program because sometimes somebody's metabolic rate can change over that 10 weeks if they've lost weight. And then we have our maintenance program. So we know that, you know, maintaining weight loss is arguably just as hard, if not harder, than losing the weight in the first place. So, you know, I've had people that have been in my maintenance program since 2018 that just keep re-enrolling and, and they, they tell me it's their anchor, right? So it keeps them, quote unquote, accountable. Uh, research has shown that many people who lost weight eventually regain it if they're not constantly being reinforced to what those habits are. So this long-term weight maintenance uh, programs provide support and accountability for successful maintainers. It's about $80 and includes eight classes over 16 weeks. And then this is our program fee, 220 out of pocket, includes that nutrition consult and follow up our, our doctors or physicians do, uh, if they take your insurance then you're just responsible for the copay. And our team, so Daphne is our clinical care program manager. Um, I am the, when I'm the instructor for the classes. Um, I'm the medical weight management facilitator. Danielle uh, provides our comprehensive nutrition assessment and behavioral change coaching. And Donna is our administrative support and our tech guru. And if you want to learn more, this is our phone number. We're located in the Medical Arts Building at Mather. Any questions? Awesome. Thank you so much, Barbara, for that great presentation. Uh, yes, if anybody has any questions, you can enter them at the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. All questions are anonymous to protect your privacy. We'll give it a few moments here just to get people gather their questions together. Sure. I know it was a lot of information that I shared there. Probably overload. Also, I'll share the um, the PowerPoint with everybody uh, once the presentation concludes, so you can have uh, Barbara's uh, information and the rest of the team's information. Great. Thank you. All right. Let's see. First question: Do you help patients that need help with diet when gall gallbladder has been taken out? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, because we also service our bariatric population here at Mather, rapid weight loss um, can lead to, it can cause them sludge in the gallbladder. And so um, a lot of times they do have their gallbladder removed. So yeah, we can, you know, discuss uh, like, uh, diet, dietary strategies usually involving a lower fat diet because the role of the gallbladder kind of works like, um, it produces, it doesn't produce, it holds bile. And when we eat a fatty meal, it, it releases the bile into our stomach and our small intestine to break up fat, kind of like Dawn dishwashing liquid. And so um, consuming a lower fat diet can help to alleviate any pain that's brought on by somebody who doesn't have a gallbladder. Do you recommend 12 step programs such as OA or Gray Sheet? I haven't heard of gray sheet. What is, I haven't heard of that. Um, I tell my patients that if they need support from other organizations like that, then, you know, some people are in Weight Watchers and then they also do our program, whatever somebody needs to support their efforts going forward. As long as that community is compassionate and empathetic and meets the individual where they are. I don't recommend any programs that shame people because we know that shame is an obstacle for behavioral change. Um, so I don't recommend those programs. So if those programs do incorporate that, that's not something I would support. Um, is this covered by insurance? I have regular Medicare. So the meeting with the doctor is covered by insurance, but the program is an out-of-pocket fee of 220. 
that's the last question at the moment. Um, I'll give it a few more seconds. And if anybody um, feels that I didn't cover anything that they wanted to hear, they expected, you know, you can please add that to the comments as well. Right. I have read that eating grilled food is not healthy since the high temperature can produce carcinogens. What is your understanding of this information? It's interesting. I was just doing a presentation in my maintenance class on, um, on adding some herbs. So for instance, rosemary um, can help. So if you grill your meat and it's very charred, if you put rosemary on it, it it can, um, or if you marinate in rosemary, then it can actually um, alleviate that. Also citrus marinades can help as well because of the antioxidants that they contain. So, but that is true. They do contain carcinogens. There was a program encouraging physical fitness that was suspended because of COVID. It was intended for bariatric surgical patients. Will that program be resuming? We keep asking. Um, and they have not reopened that to us, but we do ask like probably every three months if they're going to let us do that. Okay, that seemed like it was the last question. I'll give everybody a few more seconds here if anybody has any more. All right. It seems like that was the last one. Okay. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. If you have any additional questions, you can email them off to Mather Hospital at northwell.edu. Once you exit the webinar, you will see a, a link to complete a brief survey. It can help us um, plan future programs, so that'd be extremely helpful. Um, thank you all for joining today's webinar. If you'd like to view other Healthy You webinars, you can view them at www matherhospital.org forward slash healthy you. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody again and thank you, Barbara, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. You as well. Thanks, Jonathan. Take care, everyone.